Thanks very much, everybody. Good evening and welcome to the 92nd Street Y, where tonight we're going to introduce America's newest author, Mr. Don Rickles. And you're in for quite a night, too. Anyway, I've been a friend and a fan of Don's for, uh, we were trying to figure it out the other night, for probably 45 years. I lived in Los Angeles. I went out there in the 50s and lived there through the 50s, 60s, 70s, and into the 80s before I came back to New York in 1983. And I must tell you, in those years, Los Angeles had the greatest collection of comedians living right there in the city. Many of them came from New York when the New York politicians foolishly let the television industry slip away to LA. Some of them came out of vaudeville, some had their own radio shows that we all remember, and then starred in their own early television situation comedies. But they were all there. And in the 60s and 70s and 80s, there seemed to be a major banquet every other month, honoring or roasting somebody in Beverly Hills. And this was their chance for all those comedians to stand up and show their stuff. These were routines they had worked on for a lifetime, polished to perfection, every line, every word, carefully put together. And these people were very, very competitive with one another. Their timing was impeccable, their delivery flawless, and if you were in attendance and saw all this talent in one night in Los Angeles, you would never forget it. But when it was over, when they had to close the show, the only one they called on was Don Rickles, and he would come on like a hurricane, <laughs> seize the night, seize everyone there. Uh, it was just, it wasn't a written act. I mean, it was a spontaneous combustion of comedy made up at that moment about who was there, what they had said, and what we had just seen. And he was so lightning quick, and he was fearless. He would say the most outrageous things to the biggest stars in show business, and they loved it. And the reason Don Rickles closed the show was simply because nobody else could follow him, and everyone knew it. Now, over the years, I've interviewed Don uh, many times. I'm going to show you some of those clips. Actually, it wasn't really an interview. It was, it was really just a meeting. I was the entertainment editor for Channel 7. Uh, Eyewitness News in Los Angeles. And if Don was appearing somewhere, I'd grab a camera crew and go to the event, really just to talk to him on camera and have some laughs like the time the Friars Club was having a lunch for the manager of the Dodgers, Tommy Lasorda. Take a look. I'm here for the Lipschitz wedding. <laughs> the Lipschitz wedding, no. <laughs> Tommy who? Tommy Lasorda, he's the manager of the Dodgers. He's wanted by the Italian people in Sicily. <laughs> this man is wanted. I know he's wanted. He was in a cave in Salerno with my uncle. Look at him smiling like it's a lock. He's got a personality like a bad dugout. <laughs> what is your name, sir? <laughs> my name is Regis. <laughs> Regis? <laughs> Do you wear a dress? <laughs> Hello, Regis. Where's your earrings? <laughs> yes, just get out of the way. These... Why is this light on? What do you people want? <laughs> there you go. That's the Don Rickles that uh, I love. So how did this all happen to this quiet, somewhat shy kid from Queens? How did he go from the toughest nightclubs in New Jersey and, uh, and Brooklyn to the four shows a night in Las Vegas lounges to become the top comedian in show business, the one no one else could follow? Well, it's all in the book, the Rickles book. <laughs> and get ready, everybody, because here's the man himself, ladies and gentlemen, Don Rickles. Honored guests, <laughs> Rabbi Shulman, <laughs> Kanta Choyman, and Father Kunglin. Shalom, shalom. Thank you, Regis. I will join you in a moment. Uh, sure. I can't thank you enough for your wonderful words, which I really can't live up to. When you think of 81 years, how God has blessed me to come this far to get a chance at the Y.
And everyone said, as uh, David Rosenthal of, of Simon & Schuster said, Don, this is where it is. These are the, these are the people that will buy the book. And I'm looking at the crowd. <laughs> this is a donation crowd. This is a donation. <laughs> but I'm here. My wife and I had a chance to be in Miami at Donald Trump's home to be Regis's help. <laughs> Regis goes there with joy every 20 minutes, and they have... <laughs> and Trump comes in and says, take over everything, and I've been down there, but he's good friends with Donald Trump. Donald Trump I've worked for, too, but that has nothing to do with it tonight. We're not honoring Donald Trump, and we don't plan to honor Donald Trump, and I'm fed up talking about Donald Trump. <laughs> but it's nice to see in the front some of the elders wheezing and spitting up while I'm talking. <laughs> That's the crowd Regis gets. <laughs> God bless him in the morning when I do the show, they're all going, Regis! <laughs> Regis and Kelly! <laughs> Who the hell with any brain gets up at dawn to see the two of them walk out and introduce Farlin Mithluman and whoever the hell is. <laughs> but it's a great show, it really is. He's come a long way, Reg. I remember when we stood on the sunset on La Siena Boulevard. And yes. We mentioned Joey Bishop, and you yep. dropped your pants and had a nervous breakdown. <laughs> <laughs> and he was, the, he was the Ed McMahon of the Joey Bishop show, and Joey used to say, hey, Regis, <laughs> don't worry. And he always advised us. Remember when I used to do the show? And yeah. Joey said, you know, Regis, you, you've got to come on a different way, a different attitude. And Rickles, <laughs> you've got to try to be funny. You've got to try to be humorous, funny. And now he's in Newport in a home. Anyway. Uh, I just said that, and Regis went. <laughs> <laughs> now, Joey's a good guy. We, we made fun of him. He kind of kind of very tough with his own words, but yeah. he was a good guy. But I've come uh, a long way because of you people. I miss, at a night like this, I, I think of an emotion time. I think of Johnny Carson, rest his soul, who was so magnificent for me in my days. <clears throat> God, I had such great times with that man. And he was pretty much of a loner, personally. And when you hung out with Johnny, it was a treat, because he didn't like to be around a lot of people. But I was great. I used to be able to kid around with him and say most anything, you know. And he would always laugh, and that saved me, because that's how I started his show in New York. I came out on the stage, and he said, Mr. Mr. Rickles, on Johnny Carson. I said, and I always used to pick that up. I used to say, Johnny Carson, when I had my own show for 20 minutes. Johnny Carson, he said, I know who I am. You don't have to keep introducing me. <laughs> and I laughed, and he laughed, and I never saw him again. <laughs> anyway, uh, no, that's not true. Uh, he passed on, and uh, he was missed. And a young man by the name of David Letterman has, has done a great job. Uh, he has a lot of qualities that I would think you and I would agree that Johnny had. Nothing to take away from Jay Leno or, or Jimmy Kimmel. They're all fine artists, but... Uh, David has that extra little quality that Johnny Carson had that I admire so much and I've had great success being on his show as well as with Jay, but really with, with Johnny it was, uh, was a special time in my life. And of course, I, I'd be amiss in, in the book. I take a great deal of time to talk about a man that I, that, I, that I adored. He was tough. He was moody. He had all kinds of strange ways about him, but he was special to me and to my wife and my family. And his name was Frank Sinatra. As David said, uh, uh, very sweetly, he said, Don, why do you write so much about Frank? I said, because David, he was a part of my life that was so interesting. He gave me chances. Can you imagine a Jewish kid from Jackson Heights, Long Island? A guy that, and I don't want to, that's why I didn't write a book about that. You know, you think my book would be about, as, as a lot of people write books like, uh, um, started in the Lower East Side, my mother had cancer, my father was a gangster, <laughs> my uncle was a drunk, and my aunt was a fag, and my brother was a wild <laughs> fighter pilot, whatever the hell, and it was so, who cares? Nobody cares about that. <laughs> in fact, I have relatives that say, we're not in the book. I said, why would they care if Lou Pearlman got a headache? They don't care. <laughs> so my book is, is David Ritz, God bless him, who helped me structure this. We did it with he would speak, I'd speak into a mic about six months or more, and we'd speak into a mic, and then he'd double space it and put it on his typing machine, and we'd go, away we'd go, and I'd leave space, and I would rewrite it in my own hand to get my own voice, and I hope that comes across the stories about Sinatra and my great days with him. 
some stories about Regis and my opinion of Regis, who, who I cherish and love. And that's what, it, that's what it's all about, uh, short little shots about my memories of life. But as I was going to say, the greatest treat, the greatest treat for me was the inaugural for Ronald Reagan. I mean, here was a man that I knew as governor of California, and I was at Rose and I made fun of him. And then I'm in Hawaii with my wife, to make a short story, and the phone rings, and it's Frank Sinatra. And he got on and went, the summer wind. No, no. Anyway, uh, <laughs> he was pushing an album at that time. <laughs> I can say that now because he's dead. Anyway. Because <laughs> if he's not and he heard this, I'd be up here like saying, walk on, walk on. <laughs> I see I'm going too fast. <laughs> so Ronald Reagan. There I was, the phone rings, and Frank says, get dressed, get Barbara, get your stuff together, get to Washington, you're gonna be on the show, and we're gonna, Ronald Reagan's second inauguration. I said, Frank, you gotta be kidding. No time for kidding, I'm telling you. And as it happened, the cabinet said, you mean you want Rickles on a show for the President of the United States? And Frank said, absolutely. He said, well, what's he gonna say? He said, I don't care what he says, he's, he's whatever he wants, and that's the God's truth. They said, well, you can't do that. He said, if you can't do that, if I can't do that, you can't have me then. That's it, Rickles and me, otherwise forget it. And sure enough, they said, okay, Frank. <laughs> and I got up and made fun, and it was very successful. I told Reagan never to take a nap when I talk. And, uh, <laughs> and cabinet did what you people did. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a great night for me. And from then on, we became great pals. He was, he was something else. And he, He'll be missed, and the younger generation will hear his voice on records. For my book, if you buy it, I'm very grateful. My wife has jewelry, and my kids want to go to college. <laughs> my grandchildren, my kids are grown. I, my daughter went to USC and, and studied uh, tennis. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> she talks like her mother. Dad, my, listen, my backhand was weak, was weak. I make fun of her because she married a rich guy and took her off my back. Anyway, uh, <laughs> but I will now uh, join my dear friend Regis and we'll chat and, and I thank you and the people of Hawaii for having me and, and I thank my dear friend once again that for just taking time out from his busy schedule. He's, his wife Joy is at home now, the cook died and she's trying to make a meal. <laughs> so thank you and we'll go on. Thank you so much. Well, well, you covered everything I was going to talk about, so I guess... Uh, well, something. we can wrap it up. Get a sandwich and let's go home. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Don, uh, I met you while you were doing your business as a comedian, and in the book you talk about the early days of your life in, uh, in Queens mm -hmm. and the fact that you were somewhat shy. Mm -hmm. Were you really? Well, as I say, Reg, I, I don't know if I said it in the book, but I said, I think even including you, if I take that opportunity to say it, I think all of us as actors in our beginnings were shy. I think that's what made us actors. I mean, I always, I used to hide behind, see my mother was a very aggressive woman, mm -hmm. American born and yeah. very bright, but she was the type of woman that if you went to Radio City Music Hall and there was a line, she said, there's a line <laughs> and we will go in the front. <laughs> and I was sucking on her ankle going, don't Ma, don't. <laughs> It's called exaggeration, but she had, <laughs> she had great aggressiveness and sure. great self-esteem. Yes. And she would go to the manager and say, my son is going to be an actor, my sonny boy, that's what she said, going to be an actor and we'd like to have our seating. We've been waiting for hours. <laughs> and the manager was with those little nerds going, you, you, you got it, Mrs. Rickles, you got it. And we watched the, the movie. So that's the way that, but she was, all in, she was on your side all the way. And you know, I, I have a confession to make. I don't think, Reg, that she ever got me. She laughed and supported me. She was like, bravo. And she'd say quietly, why can't you be like Alan King? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd say, Ma, why? Because she, she was worried about my picking on people yeah. and making fun of life, you know. Right. But in the early days, you, you tried acting first at the Actors Studio, right? Right here in New York? Well, it wasn't the Actors Studio. It was what too was big it? for that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I was at the American Academy of Dramatic Arts, okay, which I graduated go. from. And, 
I'm very proud of that. Mm -hmm. I really am. <coughs> and the audience is too. And you became friends? Sounds like a Bob Newhart turnout. <laughs> and you became friends with, you know, people like Jason Robards. Yes. Terrific actor. Yes, he was. We, he loved your mother too, didn't he? Yeah, he used to come to the house and my mother made, made great chopped liver. And you don't have to be Jewish to have chopped liver. It's the kind of chopped liver that we just, you would have loved yeah. because you did that on your show the other day. Then you go, <laughs> Do a lot of that with my mother's chopped liver. You go to bed in the middle of the night and go, Mo. But you loved it when you had it. Yeah. So Jason used to come, Tom Poston, who we just lost, Tom yeah. Rest His Soul. Yeah. So I hung out with them and Conrad Bain and uh, gee, there was, there was so many when Grace Kelly was in the class. I, wow. I never got near her. I just would smell her cologne by the locker. Uh -huh. We used to hang out in the Carnegie Bar. Of course, in those days in, in the acting, you had to be a tree or a lamp or a bird. <laughs> or, and I used to say to Jason, I'm a bird. <laughs> and we'd have 12 vodkas. Boom, boom, boom. <laughs> Did you take it seriously? No, I drank the vodka to forget about it. <laughs> of course, it, but it taught, it taught me a basic background. We did plays, we had great directors, mm -hmm. and they always heard that I ate up the scenery because I was like, you know, I come from the nightclubs. It was like, you, sir, you know. <laughs> they'd say, all right, this will be a scene. You say you love the girl. I love you, Shirley. <laughs> I said, take it easy. Take it easy, you know. But he said, never lose that energy, and that energy has carried me. But I love the stories in the book about, you know, your, your career. Uh, and the first movie you made was with Clark Gable yeah. and Burt Lancaster. Is that something? The, the, the uh, submarine movie, right? Right, right. And, and of course, for years, we've chuckled about uh, the line that uh, Clark Gable said when uh, there was a, yeah. something uh, on the horizon, yeah. you think, towards well, him? It, it, can you imagine, as, as Regis brought up, it, I tell it in the book, but yeah, I'm telling you now in person, here I am, I've never done a movie in my life, and all of a sudden, uh, the director, uh, oh my God, it slipped my, my mind, one of the great, he just passed away. Anyway, I'll get his memory in a minute. <laughs> Dig him up. <laughs> <laughs> Tony, what's his name? Anyway, <laughs> so uh, we had this movie, and he's decided we gotta have Rickles in this picture, for no reason, just like that. Mm -hmm. And I, I was a sailor, and I said he'd be great for the part. And actually, there was a, there was a, a few agents at the time that, that helped out yep. and, uh, to get me this part. And I came on and said, but I had to read for it. And I never read for anything. And there was a work light, look, as, as Regis and I know, the people in our business, a light they put in the middle of the stage, and it's pitch dark out there. And I said to I said, hey, is, uh, you want me to read this about, just, Mr. Rickles, just read the part where Mr. Gable answers you on the ship about the torpedo. I said, is, is, is Mr. Gable out there? <laughs> no, 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 there's no Gable. You sure there's no Clark Gable out there? <laughs> no Clark Gable, don't worry about it. All right, quiet. And I pick up the script and I go, the sailors are ready, the gun's in trouble, and the, the men are on deck. Should we fire, fire, fire? And the voice was in the darkness comes, I say it, take it down, fire, fire, fire. And I went, <laughs> He was there. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> and the director said, snap out of it, you're getting a fit. <laughs> How'd and you get along with him? He was great. Yeah. Bert was a lovely man too. Mm -hmm. he, Bert was serious and Clark was, you know, came from the oil wells of Alabama, you know. And he was, Did he really? Yeah, and he liked to drink a little scotch. And uh -huh. I love that, you know. Yeah. I was with Jack Warden, also a very famous actor who was in the film and a great friend and he passed away just recently. You know, everything I think about, it, everybody's dead. It's only you and me. Yeah, you're right. Just to sidetrack, my son, as Regis knows, uh, he's been at my home. Up in my, in my dressing room, there's a bunch of pictures. And my son comes upstairs and, with his friends and says, you want to see my dad's pictures? And he goes, dead, 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 critical, cancer, dead, hanging on the ropes, fading out, died. And it's on my wall, on the, and I keep checking myself. I go like that. And now Regis, thank God, had a heart job, and he looks great. Thank you. Oh, gosh. So, Don, but I mean, you know, I just told everybody about what it was like in Beverly Hills when they had one of those banquets and you would close the show. All of these guys got up and did the material that they were known for, that they worked on all their lives. But when you got up, it was just like spontaneous combustion, is what I call it, and you just went out. When did that start, and how did it start? Well, it's a hard thing to say, but uh, I tell you, it started primarily at, at, 
at the parties, you know, I, I'd get up and uh, they'd have everybody speak, you know, wishing somebody luck, and I'd get up and go, I'm fed up with this party. I don't need it, the food is lousy. I never told jokes to this day, you know. I said, I'm annoyed with the host. <laughs> and to make sure the guy on the left doesn't use a deodorant and it's really getting to me, you know what I mean? <laughs> and they would laugh and ha, 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 ha. And it started out as a little joke. And little by little, I, they started to say, and, get Rickles. And all of a sudden, a guy, uh, when we did, uh, when we did the, the Dean Martin roast, yeah. uh, they, they called me and said, listen, Don, we'd like you to be on it. And to make a long story short, I, everybody else had prepared material, which is very right, and I never could prepare material. Mm -hmm. I just listened to what everybody said, right. got up, and then bang, 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 and said what I want, you know. Sure. I, you know, I was the first one to say to Frank Sinatra, I heard you sing, Frank, it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> and he did what you did, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> Had he not, this leg wouldn't be working. <laughs> uh, well, it's... <laughs> Frank was... Um... You know, but uh, in the later years, Don, you became a big monumental success in the business, and, and you always, it was your show. But in the 90s, Frank asked you, in, in his final tour days, right. to be with him. That was great. And so you opened for Frank. Yes, I did. I saw you here at the Radio City Music Hall, remember? That, that? was a treat. Radio City, stood with my mother on 57th Street. She said, look at that Don Rickles and Frank Sinatra. And by the way, Frank never got over that. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> And I used to do, you know, Laughter for Love and those songs. Yeah, sure. And he'd be in the wings going, why is he singing? <laughs> I hired his bum and now he's singing. <laughs> but it was great to the last two years of his working life. It was, we traveled. But he had a temper, didn't he? Well, yeah, he, he had his moments. Yeah, he, but never with you, was it? No, no, once he twisted my arm. No, <laughs> no he was, I was blessed. Uh, you know, I, I would make fun of him, but he had a certain compassion for me that I, I cherish. Uh, uh, and the, gentleman, the gentleman who's my road manager now knows he used to be with Frank himself, Tony Obedesano, mm -hmm. and Tony traveled with him, and then Tony used to be with us. And, and Jilly Rizzo, remember Jilly's? Sure. Jilly's in New York was a little tiny restaurant uh, uh, on Broadway, and we all used to go after work and hang out there, and Frank was, was there. What was Jilly like? Jilly was like a guy with one eye trying to see where the road was. <laughs> <laughs> no, he, uh, he, Jilly was a warm, passionate guy, but when anybody touched Frank's suit, he went, don't do that. <laughs> And then the guy walked in and says, I swollen wrist. I got a swollen <laughs> wrist. No, he was Frank's protector and, and yeah. brother, and Frank loved they him. They were very close. Yeah. Sure. Well, so, uh, so Don, your, your days as, as a comedian began in, in Las Vegas, in those lounges in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. so, and uh, you worked the shift that began after midnight. I started at midnight. I followed the great Louis Prima, Kelly yeah. Smith, and they right. were magnificent. Yes, yes. This is in the Sahara Lounge, yes, right? Sahara yeah. Lounge. And, and he um, had two shows, yeah, and then you would come that's on. That's right. And it, at that time, uh, reach, everything would clear out. There mm -hmm. wasn't a soul there. Yeah. And I walk out with three guys, a piano player and a bass player, and it just went doom, 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 doom. <laughs> and I'd come out and go, sir, the, 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 your nose looks ridiculous. Your, your wife, is that your wife? Ooh, ooh, ooh. And I would do, <laughs> see? That's the A stuff when you see me for big money. <laughs> this is just like a Jewish rehearsal. <laughs> and I know there are non-Jews here, but you'll get over it. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> I always kid about the Jews, because I'm not. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> see, you, you can't tell without the armband. <laughs> anyway, uh, hey, there's no voting. <laughs> <clears throat> but uh, as I said, uh, it, it started in a lounge and nobody was there. And I started to build up a reputation just by standing out there with the seat of my pants and talk to the audience. I never mean spirited. I never regret anything I've ever said because I never was out to hurt anybody. I was out to make them laugh. And if I laughed, I thought it was funny. And if I thought it was funny, hopefully they thought it was funny. And God has blessed me. They, you've gone, come a long way uh, with me and I've been proud of that. But I used to stand out there at two, four, and five in the morning yeah. And, and, and do it over a bar. There was a, just a pit, like here, here, here we are, right in front of me, there's a bartender serving drinks and mm -hmm. food, mm -hmm. and food. God, when I think about it. And people they, sat at the bar. Sat at the yeah. bar, and I would make fun of what they're eating. So, and so if the guy came into the cowboy hat, he yeah, was fair game. Yeah, I would do game. 10 minutes on the cowboy hat and why he was sitting there, you know. Yeah. And, that, and then what, I used to run out in the casino. That was, that was my big thing. Run out into the casino. Everybody's going, shooting a nine, five, your point five. And I run and go, hold it, hold it. I want it stopped right now, hold it. My hand to God, and the whole casino went, I don't want any gambling, it's not right, and I want it stopped. 
I'm doing a show in there, and you pay attention, or I walk. You understand me? And I walked back on the stage, and the owner said, what is he doing? <laughs> Sure. But that's how you built your following. Yeah. The, the, and then it helped when Frank would come and see you, right? Yes. The come. whole Rat Pack, Dean right. and Sammy, they'd and, all come. And they'd all do tricks. And I, and I read something, it wasn't in your book, but I read something about uh, one of Frank's uh, visits to your, to your club. And uh, he would get up after a while, 45 minutes, and he'd say, okay, that's it, let's go home. While you were still working. Absolutely. He did that one night, you said to him, sit down and shut up. I got to hear your singing. You, you were. Well, I, mean, I didn't use the word shut up, Ridge. That's why I'm famous and you're hanging on the ropes. <laughs> no, actually, what I said, I said, Frank, I listen to you sing, huh? Be a man, sit down. <laughs> there's a way, you know, there's a way. I, I was never unkind, but as you said, the biggest thing in the history of me, as you know, is when Florida, when I first met him, he came in right. with a bunch of his guys, and all those guys used to sit with him going, oh, a show, a show. Uh, uh. They were choking from gunpowder. <laughs> uh, show, Frankie, show. And I said, Frank, stand up, be yourself, hit somebody. <laughs> and the audience did what you did. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, that got a big laugh, and we became friends. Let's go over a few uh, of these celebrities. Now, what was it like to work with Bob Hope? <laughs> <laughs> you know him? <laughs> because he was a perfectionist, Bob, and he wanted everything scripted. And he wanted a certain you know, delivery. <laughs> it's a funny story in the book that it's just so Bob Hope. He, yeah, he, what happens is Bob Hope was a perfect, like Milton Berle, same thing. Same thing, From yeah. the old school, the old school. Those days, they were from the old school. Now they say, I'm from the old school. But every time I worked with Bob Hope, he, he liked me. But he was a very strict man when he yeah. came to his work. And I liked to kid around. And they had what they call a dress rehearsal with an audience. And I had it all on cards. You used to read the cards. And when I, and I, had, I did the, the big one was with George Foreman at the time and, and uh, uh, Rocky Graziano and uh, all the fighters, you know, and, and some football, uh, Alex Grasso and football players that were, you know, popular then. And it, it was a sports and a locker room scene. Uh -huh. So, you know, I read the lines, of, uh, Charlie, the helmet don't look good. And Bob Hope said, that's so funny. Jeez. And I thought it was boring. I'd say, the helmet don't look good and your head is swelling and you look like a moron. That's what you look like. And I used to embellish, you know. You'd add lips, sure. And the audience would start to laugh. Now, dissolve. Now we go in his office, and he says, Don, uh, you know I love you, but let's, let's go over the script now. Now, you walk out. What are you going to do? I'm going to say, hi, Bob. Is that, is that the way you're going to say it? <laughs> well, yeah, Bob, what, what, what's wrong? <laughs> like, and the writers would all sit there, and they'd yeah. all do what you did. <laughs> you know, this is before I even said anything. <laughs> they were like guys with sticks on their ass, those dolls, you know. <laughs> and, oh, I used ass, and this is the Y. <laughs> Cancel a minion. <laughs> and so, so they would all sit there, and, Bob, and I'd say, he said, try it again. Hi, Bob, how are you? <laughs> it's wrong. <laughs> It's wrong. You, you, ask the writers. It's wrong, kid. It's wrong. <laughs> Ten times in an office. Hey, Bob. Hey, Bob. Wrong. Wrong. <laughs> That's the way he was. He, he wanted it just a, a certain sound. Uh -huh. But he was a good man, and he, he but, always made it a little difficult. But he him. was a good friend. Didn't you go to England with him and meet the, all the royalty? That's right. Uh, what, Princess Margaret. Yes. One of the... They had a show. Uh, uh, Bob Hope, uh, Newhart, my good friend, and I, and... Uh, and Tully Savalas and Roger Moore, and they had a lot. Jack Hawkins, the, the great British actor, and had Princess Margaret there. Right. And Bob Hope gets up and make a long story short, and he introduces Bob Newhart, and he does great. And he introduces Tully, and they does some shtick, and it was great. And again, I'm the last guy. <laughs> and I'm sitting there, and I'm saying to the guy, could I have a, a vodka, please? <laughs> and in, in England, the vodka is to here. <laughs> I said, that's okay if you have a sty. <laughs> <laughs> but you, but you so, talk to the but, queen. So, so, they all do it. Bob Hope introduces me, right? Yeah. Bob Hope goes, ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you, that's weird, that was his hook line. I want to tell you, we have a kid here from the United States, fine young comedian, he's a wonderful kid, he's a fine guy. He's going to make fun of you, but it's only a joke. So, <laughs> your majesty, your ma'am, please don't worry, it's just in fun. 
and I think you're gonna enjoy them. Everybody here, and it's all royalty there, and everybody here is gonna enjoy them, and he's gonna make fun of the queen, but it's only a joke, he's a fine guy. He doesn't, <laughs> he doesn't he mean really any harm. Worried. Yeah, he was serious, it, it yeah. doesn't mean any harm. So what do you say, we give him a hand when he comes out, but it's a joke, and remember <laughs> that he's trying to be nice. And I said to the guy, give me a triple vodka, for quite a while. <laughs> And I went out, and I went, and I made fun of Princess Margaret, and made fun of the queen in, in my good taste, and I, I felt it was, and everybody laughed, and it was great. And the show was over, and I sat down, and a, a guy in white gloves comes over and says, ah, a man would like to see you. So my wife, naturally, she starts to get up, and Bob Hope says, I'll go with him. He said, no, no, just wants to see Mr. Rickles. So Newhart whispers, I'll go to the hotel and get the luggage. <laughs> Sit down, Princess Margaret, Jack Hawkins, Anthony Quayle, they were her escorts. Mm -hmm. And she has like a dossier in front of her. And her opening remark is to me, sit down, all well, their secret Scotland Yard is standing around. And everybody says, oh, watch this, what's gonna happen? Because I made fun of everybody. And she said, are you a Jew? And I went, oh, jeez, oh. <laughs> and Jack Hawkins immediately reached, leaned over and said, Dawn, it's only a hard dossier. She's not anti-Semitic, it's nothing like that. I said, oh, oh, oh. And she wasn't, she really wasn't, but that's very abrupt. She had it on the paper, the Jewish. She said, you know, I know so much about you. She said, you're very quick. I didn't get it all, but you were funny and quick. She said, may I tell you, she said, you'll talk about your mother. Your mother, your mother lives in Miami Beach, am I, am I correct? I said, yes, but your mother's, at the time my mother was, your mother's 83. I said, yes. She said, my mom is 83. She's talking about the Queen of England. <laughs> I said, yes, she said, Oh, isn't that wonderful? Both 83. <laughs> she said, you know, I understand your mom has a condominium in Miami. I said, yeah, she said, my mom has an apartment right down the street, sort of a condominium. <laughs> Talking about the palace. <laughs> she said, so you see, they both have emphysema. Poor things, they both had emphysema. Yeah. Emphysema bad. She said, Yes, both emphysema, so alike, Dom. Isn't that wonderful? I said, ma'am, there's one difference. She said, what's that? I said, your mother has a flag on the roof. <laughs> oh, God. Such great stories. You know, Don, I showed a, a little clip. I'm showing people a clip of the interviews and the things that we did uh, years ago out in Los Angeles. Yes, we had fun. I just take a crew just to be with you and, and get some laughs. And uh, so it, this is um, this takes place in the Palladium in Hollywood. Oh. Paul Anka had a TV special. You were a guest on the show, and uh, you walked by and uh, interrupted my interview with Paul Anka. Take a look at this. Wait, see, thank you. I guess so. Yeah. How do you feel about this uh, special you're doing? Well, this special is very special. We got a lot of dear friends on, got some good buddies. Uh, it's a good moment for me because ABC and I have been for such a long time. <laughs> You'd better let me say hello to you in a minute. Come Hold over on, here. Come over, over here. Come over here. How are you, Paul? There's a basket case landing four lines. Yes, can I help you? I'm talking to Mr. Hanka. We don't need any strangers from Ralph's Market, if you don't mind, sir. They are looking for some derelict. He seems to been sitting in an alley with a brown bag and a bucket of wine. Just stop it. Go away. Is he singing? Is I'm not telling way? you anything. Why did I wear this outfit today? Why did I wear this outfit today? You want to tonight? get yourself a tree and become a... <laughs> which you That's can't even use, but you're a definite parakeet in that <laughs> trick-or-treat outfit, making a fool of yourself. Paul, it's good to see you. Right, God bless you, really. And good luck, as a great show. Some great big stars are in there. You're included? Pardon me? Absolutely. You're included? Oh, no, I'm on a tour. I'm in downtown L.A. on a tour, and the bus got stalled here, and that's why I came by the Palladium. I'm waiting for Lawrence Welk to suck bubbles for a half hour. Dumbbell, why am I here? Go away, Regis. That's why you'll never be a star. You got some sort of wheezing disease. <laughs> Paul, God bless. Take care. Oh, God, Long live Lebanon. Uh, and then there was the evening that uh, Don uh, attended a party at the Beverly Wilshire Hotel. This was to uh, salute all the Los Angeles people who would come to the Sahara to see you perform. <laughs> and we had, a, we had an experience there. <laughs> 
Who are all your friends here tonight? And what is this party all about? I have no idea. I'm with the chef's union. <laughs> this man here, this is a Chicano, and I'm helping him out. They plan a strike, and I'm going to lead the march. And we're going down to Parker Center for a few laughs. Isn't that nice? That's great. <laughs> Hello, Mom. <laughs> ABC News doesn't go to Torrance or anyplace else, does it? No, just stays in town. We stay right in town here. Good. Tell me about your summer plans this summer. You and Newhart going away? Yeah, we're annual... going to go down to the beach and attack a lifeguard. <laughs> Actually, we're going to go to Paris, but you wouldn't know too much about that. It's too long a bus ride. Yeah, but this you. guy wants some food. Pardon me. I hate an old guy that's hungry. I hate that. Anyway, uh, <laughs> no, you look terrific. Irving Berlin. Anyway, uh, good to see you, Irv. Love your tunes. But uh, this is the uh, biggest Sahara Fair tonight. You know, yeah. the, all the people that are <laughs> going to spend their money at the Sahara Hotel in Las Vegas. Uh, and I'm here to, with Bert Conrad. Who's Conrad's this guy hanging over your shoulder? <laughs> 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 this, oh, not the real <laughs> You remember him. <laughs> He was in the Hulk. <laughs> anyway, uh, works on the barge out of Detroit. I don't know who he is. But uh, Newhart and I are going away right after this affair. No, like shortly it. we're going away to, uh -huh. to Europe, this Paris. Then we're going to Europe. And then we're going to Marbella, Spain, and so forth. Good for you. You're becoming world travel, isn't right. you? Spit all over me, Regis. I love that. <laughs> How is your show doing? I don't see it. It's on too early. I understand you're putting it on at 5 in the morning now. No, no. Before it's on at night. It's the top-rated show in town. <laughs> really? You're so humble. I love an Irish guy that's humble. <laughs> I want to know why this party's being held. Is the Sahara getting nervous? No, 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 no. See, the, the, the people of the Sahara get lonely, see? So they throw these big parties in town to get the feel of a crowd. See, it's a very big hotel. You know about it. You well, read it in all the papers. Why are you here? I see a billboard full of Buddy Hackett, Johnny Carson, Eddie Arnold. Why aren't they here? <laughs> they weren't invited. <laughs> Never at a loss for words or, or for a funny line. You ever think about moving back to New York? I have to hang out with you? <laughs> One time, I, I, I tell you, oh, go ahead. No, but years ago, but maybe 20 years ago, you did come back to New York, and you and Barbara walked in to see the Trump Tower. Mm. Oh, and, yeah. and Donald Trump came out, and this was the first time you okay, saw. I remember him. that. Too. And this was, you know, 20, 22 years ago. Yeah. And uh, you told me a funny story. And, uh, he, about he took us. We were, we were curious. We wanted to see an apartment. We said, Donald wants to see an apartment, and we took us into an apartment. The kitchen was about as big as that box. <laughs> the living room with these two chairs. <laughs> The bathroom was like on an airplane. You pulled the ledger. He says, Don, look at the view. Look at this bay window. Two billion seven. Two billion seven, and that's for you. That's for you. <laughs> but then he, he said, you got to do what Paul Anker did. You break through a whole wall. You go all the way across with a bay window. Seven billion nine. <laughs> it's a bargain. Oh, gosh. But we never came back. <laughs> and how did you meet your lovely wife, Bob? She was a hooker for the FBI. Ah. <laughs> okay. Get a good job. Yeah. yeah. No, God bless her. I always make fun of her, but why not? It pays the rent, you know. <laughs> no, she's a great lady. I met a, a Jack Gilardi at the time, a fine agent, who's still an agent sure. at ICM. He, he was, uh, had Barbara as his secretary. And Barbara was with him for six years, and before I met her and took her away from all of that, uh, she, she, was, she was very, very astute, Wonderful girl with mm -hmm. a, a great deal of warmth and charm, but a layback lady. Uh -huh. And I was the, you know, the hello, how are you? And she was going, stop it, pull yourself together. <laughs> <laughs> so did you pursue her? Well, the way it happened was I came to see Jack Gelati one day, and she was at the desk, my first meeting with her. And I, this is God's truth. And she said, and I, and I do her voice subtlety. And I said, I'd like to see Mr. Gelati. And she said, what is it in regard to? <laughs> I said, I'm a butcher, and I have a truck outside. <laughs> and she said, being a wise guy <laughs> will not get you in to see Mr. Jalal. <laughs> Please, I want to see him. Just yeah. control yourself. <laughs> and Bob buzzed and went in. That shocked me, because she came on so back off. And then I was in the lounge, fast forward, and she was with some friends and standing behind a rope. In those days, I was really hot in the lounge. And yeah. She said, hi, Donna, it's me, Barbara. Oh. Can you get me a table? I said, see the head made a deep. <laughs> <laughs> and then I always had a thing for singers in those days. If the girl sang and you were on the road, they go, swan, ooh. Anyway, so I was always with singers. And uh, my mind was pretty well occupied because when you're on the road, you're lonely. But I kept calling Barbara. Oh. Right on the phone, calling mm -hmm. Barbara. She said, what is it you want? I said, just a date. <laughs> and the first date, we went out, and I pulled up the car, and I said, Barbara, come on, sweetheart, here's the car. And she said, and I had the motor going, and she didn't get in. I said, why didn't she get in? There's a thing called opening the door. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the beginning of a Jew torture. <laughs> uh -huh. 
But I love her sure. to this very day. We're She's, married 42 years. Yeah. <laughs> Terrific woman. Oh, God. Now, why don't we reminisce a little bit about the people you met in the business, some of them mentioned in the book. But Ed Sullivan, did you ever do the Ed Sullivan show? Once. You did? And we were good friends. Yeah. And I did it up in uh, Lillian Lewis's home. Uh, Mo Lewis, her husband, rest his soul, was a big promoter and friends of Ed and ours. And mm -hmm. we all stayed. We all had a party at her house. And, and Ed was there. And, and they, his son-in-law always said, you know, but Ed wants you on the show. He said, I want Rickles on the show. I think he's a funny kid, funny guy. And I say, Ed, I, I don't do stand-up. I don't come out and one and tell jokes. But it's not for me. You can do something, damn it. Be a hell of a night. Hell of a night. So his son-in-law said, I got an idea. Don, you come out, and in between each act, you'll put down the act and say, Ed, he, you don't need the act. Ed will laugh, and then you'll run off. In, in Las Vegas, the monkeys come out, the Barzini monkeys. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, the wonderful Barzini monkeys are going to come out here on this stage, and I run out. Ed, Ed, what are you doing out here? Ed, you don't need the monkeys. The monkeys are lousy. They're going to louse up the stage. They're going to be dirty. You're going to have to put paper down. Get rid of the monkeys. The monkeys smell, boom, boom, boom. You smell. <laughs> Why are you out here? Anybody ask you to make fun of the monkeys? And I ran off, and I said, Bob, the guy's going to kill me with this. And every time I ran out, he said, who the hell sent you out here again? Show's over, we go back to Lillian's house, we're having a drink, I'm in the other room with my wife going, oh, my career's over, I'm moving. <laughs> Ed walks in and says, what did I, you killed him. You were special. You son of a bitch, you really knocked him right on their ass. And then he said, we were very good. Yeah, like yeah, he, yeah. Yeah. We did it, kid, we did it. <laughs> we did it. Buried me, buried me. But not, not meaningful, he didn't even realize it. He, he didn't, you know. We used to go to Danny's hideaways in those days, you know. Yeah. And he'd say to me, is this a great night? And we didn't have anything. We just were sitting there. <laughs> what a night. This is a great night. Tell me about Jack Benny. All the comedians loved Jack Benny. Yeah, he was, a, he was what he was. The way he performed, he was that kind of guy. Wasn't cheap, though. Certainly wasn't cheap. Yeah. But he created that great image. Right. And uh, my experiences in the book, uh, he, uh, George Burns told him about me. He said, you know, Jack, Jack, you, you got to see this kid. And, 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 and. And, and you'll love him, he, make, he makes fun of everybody, and, and, and you're gonna think it's bad, but it's not bad. I'm telling you. I know the kid, and you're gonna love him. You know, George, I don't need it. I don't need a guy making fun of me. Forget about it. No, you don't have to applaud it. 30 years ago, I needed you for that. You know. 50 years, anyway. You know, I don't need the kid. Anyway, make a long story. Benny, uh, George convinced Benny to come see well, I come out on the stage, and I'm really uptight. Jack Benny, Jack geez, I want to do yeah. good. I do the show, and God, it was good. It was a good show. It really was. Show's over. Uh, my stage manager comes and says, Mr. Rickles, Jack would like to see you. I said, oh, great, great. B please bring him up. I came up in the dressing room, and I'm sitting there in, in the bathroom, and I'm still like a little perspiring towel. I'm saying, gee, gee, Jack, it's so nice of you to come to the show. I hope you enjoy it. And he just went like, you know, kid, I've seen a lot of guys. George told me you insult people, you see. And I'm the first one that it's not my cup of tea. You know, tonight, watching you was a big kick for me. You really, really came through, kid. And God bless you. And I enjoy it. How about dinner? And I said, Thank you, Jack. I said, Bob, he enjoyed it. Bob said, stop it, stop it, just that casual. Okay. <laughs> and you we go to there. dinner. Yeah. And in those days, in, the, in the, the room, the restaurant, they had the flaming carts, you know, and the, and the violins, you know. That's how I used to get broads. <laughs> <laughs> the flaming carts. And sure. all that, you know, Bob and I sit down, <clears throat> and Bob says, I'll have the, the uh, vodka martini with the olive, and I'll have a Another vodka up him. Jack, what do you have? I'll have a diet Pepsi. <laughs> okay. Next thing comes, flaming thing. I said, I'll have the veal, Jean Baton, blah, 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 with the flaming sauce. And Don, what are you going to have? <clears throat> said, I'll have the, the lamb chops with the lambana and the mayonnaise and the boom on the side with the boom and the salad. Jack, what are you going to have? 
I'll have two poached eggs. <laughs> on toast and a hot cup of tea. <laughs> oh, he's great. That was my dinner. Just wonderful. Um, you talked about Johnny Carson, and remember the time that I picked you up and, uh, and then two of you wound up in the tub? You didn't know that was going to happen, no. did you? No. They, they played that over the years, over, over and over, and over again. Over. Yeah. It was great. It was great. He came up with some great things. And, he really did. And that and, was a highlight thing with me. And then you were playing the CPO Sharky. Mm -hmm. And I guess on the show, oh, you, God, <laughs> you broke his little cigarette box yeah, or something that like thing. that. Yeah. And he took umbrage and came right across well, the hall at NBC. Yeah. yeah it was a joke. Did you know he was coming? No. Uh, in those days, you know, as you know today, you have the handheld cameras. Yeah. Those days, those big giant things. They had to push it push it all the way yeah. into the next yeah. studio. Yeah. And he came in, and that's, that's when the famous line came, and he made fun of me during the middle of a take, and blah, blah, blah. And then I said, Johnny Carson. He said, I know who I am. Stop <laughs> introducing me. <laughs> and that became his favorite thing. It was a classic. Well, Don, were you much of a ladies' man before you got married? <laughs> I mean, you were 38 when you got married. 38. You know, I had, I, my younger years, too, as I got older, that sort of eased off. But even later on at 38, they always had the reputation, you know, being the loudmouth guy that would snitch on them if we had made love or anything. Really? Like well, it wasn't me, but they always thought that, you know, don't go with Rickles, oh, the whole world will know what happened, you know. But, <laughs> and I always became a little shy about that. Oh. And everybody thought I was the most brazen kid in the world. Yeah. But thank God, God was good. He sent down my barber and saved See me. See that? Saved you. Yes, he did. Saved you. All right, uh, I'm going to show you how Don Rickles uh, attracts women. Uh, <laughs> You'd be surprised. I mean, they really come on to him. And I was over there. It was the night they were honoring uh, Danny uh, Thomas. And it was a wild night. And the people, the crowd was wild. And this woman came up to you and wanted a kiss. And it became a little bit of a classic. Take a look at this. Look at this, Ethan. Who are some of the giants here tonight? Uh, King Kong. <laughs> I'm about the biggest. You're the biggest name in the world. I looked world. around and they're all warm-ups. But Frank is Kenny coming. Rogers is running around the lobby going, gambling man, game. I said, fine, Kenny, great. Great song. And Ed Nelson is my idol. He's my trainer. What is it? Look at, oh, he's dusting you off. Daddy Simon asked me to kiss you. Yeah. And this is just some weird woman. <laughs> anyway. Everybody wants to, everybody wants to be with you. All right, lady, wait in the back. Wait in the car, lady. I'm sorry, lady, can't touch you. Lady, what do you want from Don Rick? Lady, give me a break. My career is hanging on the front here. Danny Simon asked me to kiss you. Him. All Lebanese were surrounded. Oh, hey. All Lebanese. Warm up the car. It's all Lebanese. I don't have a chance. They got the wild eyes, don't okay, they? Okay, God bless. Get the truck. Get the truck. Are you on the north? Wait a minute. There's one Lebanese girl. He took over. Wait a minute. There's one Lebanese girl who wants to give you a kiss. Hello, my darling. Will it be a donation? Shalom. Shalom. Uh, Regis, this turned out to be a special, Regis. It's a special. This lady still wants I don't know who this lady is. Get her a newspaper stand, something. Go downtown Hollywood. I, I don't need this kind of bedlam. You know how Danny feels you know at Hillcrest now, huh? I hope your camel dies. Leave me alone already. Sorry, Mr. Rickles. Yes, I can't handle it right anymore, Regis. Goodbye, Never call Tom. me again. Sorry, your camel. Go away, lady. Go away. See that? Oh, God. I just have one more tape to show everybody, but you know, one time I did a, a five-part mini-series, Don Rickles in Las Vegas. Mm. Flew over there with the camera crew, and we, and we, we did a five-parter, uh, an interview in Don's dressing room and uh, on stage and backstage and, and all of that. And um, uh, we began the series with uh, this story about uh, the Don Rickles that not too many people know. Watch this. You know, there were really two Don Rickles. I should establish uh, this right now at the beginning of the series. On stage, on camera, he is the relentless attacker, the consummate wise guy. His act spares no one, no nationality, no religion, no race. No one is exempt, not even his wife. He takes no prisoners and he plays no favorites. But off stage, Rickles is warm and sentimental and loyal. Example, years ago here in Los Angeles, there was a small nightclub on La Cienega Boulevard called the Slate Brothers Club. Rickles made that his home base and the movie crowd flocked in. They loved him. The biggest crowds in Hollywood vied for his insults. But Rickles' career was at a standstill. He befriended the club bartender, a man named Harry, Harry Goines. And he promised his friend that if he ever got that break, he'd take him along with him. God only knows how many promises like this have been made in small clubs all over this country, but this one was kept. 
In 1958, Rickles saw some daylight. He called his friend Harry, told him to pack his bags, and together they ran for it. And through the years, through all the good times and all of the bad, they have been together. Now, of course, there are only good times. And at the Sahara Hotel in Las Vegas, Harry is there with us when Don Rickles walks in. What a night this is. Mr. Rickles, how are you? Oh, what a treat. You're here to see me? I can't believe it. Just when I want to get dressed, I have to have that annoying person like you in my room. I want to thank you, Harry. This is Harry, my dear friend. He's been with me a lot of years. He checks for grenades and everything. Check the room. There's no mines in here. Now, Harry's been with you how many years? Well, it'll be to almost 22. We met at the Slate Brothers. He was a bartender, and I was a comedian searching for women and in desperate heat. And this man used to calm me down by singing a spiritual by my, by my bed. But actually, you made uh, Harry a promise, right? That uh, I said if I make it big, I would take him with me. And now, thank God, I've been successful, and I'm dumping him. <laughs> I don't need him anymore. Oh, gosh. I just, I just want to say a quick word, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and Regis, that was very sweet. Uh, Harry Goins is a man that was with me for 40 years. He was a bartender. <sighs> and I wish he was here tonight. He was a hell of a guy. Well, wonderful gentleman, yeah. Well, Don, now, uh, you know, I know that you all have questions for Don Rickles. I mean, he is here to, uh, to entertain and, and to inform you and to tell you the answers to whatever your questions happen to be. What we need is a little light so Don can see you. And then if you, if you have a question, just kind of raise your hand. Let me know that you want to say something to Don. Don't be afraid. <laughs> we have security here. Yeah, there's a gentleman right over there. Why don't you stand up and yell out your question? Now, wait a minute. There are two guys. <laughs> One a, l let this guy go first, and then I'll get you. Yes, sir. <laughs> he was referring to, I used to do a, a, a joke about my wife and Geronimo, and I strapped myself to the bed, circled the bed, and, went, and I was Geronimo, and, hey, 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 hey. <laughs> and she'd say, attack, Geronimo, attack. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, who's the next? Yes, sir. I don't have, uh, my career has never been involved with hecklers, and, and if I do, I would never talk about it, because early in my career, uh, Maybe a few stood up, and now they have Blue Cross. <laughs> <laughs> yes, anyone else? Yes, yes, sir. Hey? <laughs> hey, Charlie! <laughs> Yeah, it was true. Buy the book. <laughs> that was a true story, and yes, it, it's in the book, and I uh, love the way you tell that story. It's a great, great Don Rickles story. You, yeah. Yes, anyone else? Yes, way over there, and that gets the wall. Yes, ma'am. You know, Thank you for asking that. No, you know, in my career, I have never, to my knowledge, and I'm sure there are certain performers and just people. See, my, my theory is when you stand on the stage, as Regis and I do, and I can't speak for Regis, but I'm sure he'll agree, when you're out there selling yourself, you can't please everybody. And I'm sure in my performances over the years, but nobody in particular, thank God, has made it a very uh, noticeable thing of dislike for me. But if they had, I'm sorry, but I do what I do, and I feel that all of us, when you sell yourself, as human beings, you can't win everybody. I tried to, I tried to. You know, but the celebrities were the ones who caught on to Don Rickles first. And uh, no kidding, they, they, he was a tremendous hit in Hollywood in this club we were talking about, the Slate Brothers Club. And it was people like Frank Sinatra who brought the crowds to, um, to Las Vegas. And, and Frank was one of the ones who would insult and, and they all really, frankly, loved it. And I, the word reaches, you know, has made me successful. I always keep saying it's not insult, as Johnny Carson gave me that great title, which I use today, uh, Mr. Warmth, when they introduced yeah. me, uh, which is true, because uh, uh, the word insult always, was always something that, that was a lousy kind of guy, and I really don't do that, but I, it, people have known me with that title, so I've gone along with it over these years, and it's been successful for me, but I, I'm really not that person that insults somebody. I exaggerate and make fun of us, but it's not like an insult to me as somebody that's facetious and kind of mean, and I'm certainly not that. 
He really isn't. <laughs> so don't be afraid. Yes, sir, okay. right here. Would you stand up, sir? Uh, do you have a favorite, uh, Dean, Martin have a favorite Dean Martin celebrity roast story? Oh, there's, there's so many stories about Dean, and I think that the book will tell it all. Not to cut you short on that, but we'd be here till Tuesday if I started in with Dean Martin. But one in particular, I remember Frank Sinatra at the inaugural for Ronald Reagan. We were in the dressing room, and Frank brought me up. I was in a small dressing room downstairs in, in the Kennedy Center, and Frank said, tell that bullet head to get his bags and get the Secret Service and get him up here. And sure enough, there I am with Dean, Frank, and Sammy, and all of us in this big dressing room. And Sammy went out someplace, and all the, all the guys were standing with the Uzis in the coats going, they're supposed to guard us. They're going, look at what Don's doing. Look what Frank's doing. You know, <laughs> if somebody wanted to shoot us, they'd be too busy watching us. <laughs> anyway, so we were there, and Frank said, now listen, guys, there's no drinking before the show. This is the President of the United States. This is a big night. I don't want any booze. Nobody tell you, you got it, Pally. <laughs> Rickles and I are going to just sit here and wait till, wait till you just go out there and do, do a little show. <laughs> There's going to be no boozing, no boozing. You got it, Frank. You got it, baby. And Frank left, and sure enough, Dean walked out. He opened up his coat, and it was like airplane bottles. Like <laughs> <laughs> and he said to the president, boom. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes. What, what did he say to you? Well, basically, he, he started talking about, uh, he brought up the Navy. Uh, and, I, and I mentioned, you know, he, he, he asked me, like, you know, were you in the Navy? And I said, no, my father was in World War II. And he said, oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so he started going through the whole thing about World War II. And then, um, you know, later on in the show, he, I was drinking a Corona out of the bottle. Yeah. And I said, oh, I'm not drinking glass. <laughs> Thank you. Very nice. <laughs> Way back there, yes. Speak up. When you think of President Bush. <laughs> I never get into politics, but I do think one thing. No matter who the president is, and there, I've known five, I do think that our people in this world today when they talk about a president, whether they love him, God forbid, use the word hate, I hate the word hate, or dislike, fine. But I, I think the office should be respected, that people should not, <laughs> should not get vicious and nasty and say things. If you say, I don't like the man or I don't approve, fine. But don't go and SOB and this and that. If the President of the United States, don't you think the guys in Europe and the other countries say, look at this, they make a, a putz out of our president. I mean, maybe, maybe some of us, and a good deal at this time, have problems, but still respect the office. That's my opinion. Okay. All right, ma'am. Might you stand up? Well, what I leave out is stories about my Uncle Saul. You, know, <laughs> you care if he smoked a cigar and yelled at my Aunt Dora? Who cares? <laughs> so I wrote memoirs, little episodes in my career that I think are fun, and some, some are serious about my mother and my father, and things that I think would be your interest in. A, a good read and a fast read that you don't have to worry about chapter nine, what, what are we up to? And so that's my thought. And, uh, as far as you saw me at the Copa, I thank you. Those were, those were great days. She wanted to know why, why you're writing the book now. We've talked about this over the years. Well, as David, you know, of the Simon & Schuster said to me, he came to see me with my manager, Elliot Weissman, and said, uh, listen, Don, you, we want you to write a book. I said, everybody has a book, you know. He said, no, because it's you. And I bought that. He said, you. Get, mm -hmm. I want your voice in the book. And from the folks I talked to say that my voice is in that book, and I, I hope you'll all agree. 
when you read the book, it, it is like Don talking to you. That's, that's the way the book is written. Yes, way back there. Yes, sir. Not at all. I just think there, I think the star quality in those days was different, and the young people today are time marches on, and I don't think they feel that kind of thing anymore. And uh, uh, they they do have roasts, and some of them are pretty strong. But hey, if they still buy it, more power to them. But uh, the old days, I think, are gone, and, and now it's time to move on. You know, that's one thing, Don. You never really have used the four-letter words or anything even close to that in the act. No, never. No. Am I right or am I yeah, wrong? It's, it's true. It's, it's not something I planned. It's just in my personality. Uh, son of a bitch, pardon my expression, is my big word in the act. That's about it. And I've never gone any further. And I never felt I had to go any further because it's not my style. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Blue, blue shirt, yes? Funny is funny. I, I, there's so many young people coming up and so many guys and, you know, like uh, uh, Jerry Seinfeld is, is a gem in what he did. Uh, there's so many, I, I pick him out because he just recently came to see me in Atlantic City and he's a charming guy. And uh, the young people, if, if an audience laughs and some of them come on with some stuff that's pretty weird to me, but they laugh and I sit by the set and I laugh. So I guess as long as they laugh, they got it made. The fellow behind him, yes. Who? <laughs> Bob Newhart's book. Oh, that's a silly question. You know damn well that I enjoy Bob and he enjoys me. We're not in competition and I love what he says and, and I like to think he loves what I say. Wasn't, isn't that a strange friendship though? It's apples and oranges. Uh, we met because of our wives and I say that and Bob always kids me. There he goes again. It's key. The wives are key. And it's true. If the wives get along, in my opinion, the guys will always become good friends, most times. But and didn't Bob, go ahead, I'm No, sorry. and Bob's wife and, and, and Jen and my wife Barbara became sort of like sisters. They're very close. They talk to each other constantly about life and what have you. And Bob was completely different from me from the Midwest and very uptight about a lot of things. He, he was a very big Catholic when I first met him. Now he's practically a Jew. <laughs> <laughs> With with my coaching, he still, he still, Reg, to this day, I swear to God, to this day, he can't say what you know. He goes, I say, Bob Lachayim, and he goes, Lachayim. <laughs> and I say, that's a ranch in Mexico. <laughs> Didn't he worry when, when, say you were on a cruise together, and you were a little loud or obstreperous, you know, and he would say, please, don't, don't attract on Well, that, that, I used to do that to put him on, like in Germany, we're in Munich. Yeah. And I would walk into the restaurant, and the waiter would come up and say, do you think we could have the salmon? <laughs> and Newhart would go, don't, 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 don't do that. <laughs> don't, don't start that. It's not funny. Don't do it. <laughs> then we walk down the street, and I go, you know, Bob, my legs are bothering me, you know. Ah. <laughs> uh. You know, I don't know what, Don, what time is it because... Uh, we, it's 12 o'clock, we gotta go home. <laughs> really? It's now quarter to nine. Quarter to nine, okay. Yes, sir, white shirt, sure. Uh, I thought you were absolutely great. Oh, thank you. Oh, sure, but you know, as time goes on, uh, it's hard to find mm. parts uh, that are suited to... Uh, I'm 81 years old, and you know, there's, uh, how many grandfathers can you play? <laughs> but uh, hopefully, if before it's all over, if I get an opportunity, I would love to do that. And I thank you for Casino. I got the part, uh, Marty Scorsese, who is a great director and a lovely man, he happened to think of me, and I wasn't even in the original script. And he wrote in a part called Billy Sherbert. And I worked with De Niro, and that was great, because with Bob De Niro, who was a marvelous actor, but I came from, you know, I, you know, kidding around a lot. I said, Bob's very serious, don't kid around, you know, he's very serious. <laughs> So the first day we're on the set and I got a handheld camera and I'm walking down. They go, roll him. And he goes, oh, you know, I don't feel good. <laughs> and I feel it. The boy. I says, I can't work with this man. He's a mumbler. I can't. <laughs> From that day on, we became great friends. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to get as many as I can in here. Oh, okay, this fellow right here. This is his third question, I think. <laughs> go ahead. Beautifully. 
Well, thank you, but I, I like to think I was part of that. We used to meet in the steam room in the Sands Hotel, and Frank and Dean gave me a bathrobe called the Rhino. <laughs> and this bathrobe had a giant head of a rhino on back, and each one had a title, and I was the rhino. And I always hung with them before the show. My show was midnight, and they went on at 8 o'clock. And Frank had hors d'oeuvres and booze and what have you, and we, the doors were closed, and we all sat in, in the steam room and had great fun together. So I was a little bit part of the Rat Pack. Didn't they once force you out of that steam room? Yes, they, they in could... the middle of the day, that's right. In the middle of the day, the lunch hour, we, we went early one day for some reason or other, and we're all sitting there, and Frank says, let's, let, hey, Rickles is doing so good. Let's make him really big in this business. Something you might think of. <laughs> let's make him really big in this business. And I'm completely nude with a towel, and all of a sudden the door opens, and they pull the towel off, and there I am, completely nude, by the pool. <laughs> <laughs> and people go, look at Rickles trying to be funny again. Look at <laughs> Is there anybody up in the balcony who has a question for Don? Guess the balcony doesn't like you. Look at that, Abe Lincoln's up there. <laughs> Anybody? Okay, well, go ahead, let's hear it. Uh, Don, what do you think of Reeves as a singer? <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> Why the hell did I go to See, the balcony? See, he said singer, look at this, the old man took a cab, look at this. There's a big fan, right in the front boy, of the cab. Boy, oh boy, walked right out. Okay. He was afraid I was going to sing to him. Yeah. I think of Regis as a singer. Regis, whatever he does on the stage, he does it well. And he's charming and beautiful. And when he sings, and I always kid him. I said, Regis, you're going to do that. When Irish eyes are smiling, or, you know, and I always kid him about that. But he sells whatever he does. And that's why he's a big star today. And I love him. Isn't it funny? You started with Sinatra, you wound up with me. <laughs> yes, lady. Yes, so I'm Again, I think the Ronald Reagan inaugural. I do, uh, with, with Mr. Sinatra and, and having all the cabinet and all the distinguished... And you put gentlemen. out a good show that night? Oh, yeah. Geez, I was right on. I, I had no idea what I was going to say. I just ran down the aisle and... Uh, Secretary Schultz at the time was yeah. sitting in the front. I said, Mr. Secretary, your dicky is popping up. <laughs> Did they get it? Absolutely. They got it, sure. <laughs> well, we're about to close shop here. What do you want for 25 bucks? <laughs> is that what it was? <laughs> 25 bucks. Man is killing himself here. But I love him. I, I got to tell you, as a young guy, uh, I forget where I saw him first, but I was so taken by him that when I was working in San Diego, California, starting my own television career, uh, I heard that he was appearing at a, at a ad agency's luncheon. And so I went down to see him and we did an interview out on the sidewalk in front of the U.S. Grand Hotel in San Diego. And uh, well, I, I just fell in love with him and I've been following him for years and years and years. And the biggest thrill I would have in this business is that when I would have Don Rickles as a guest, because I knew it was going to be sheer dynamite and entertainment, and Don has never, ever let me or any other television host down. He's always been the best, most outrageous guest we've ever had. I think we should wrap it up. I want to say something about you, though. I want to say something. What was that? Well, wait. You know, you've been very patient, and we, we thank all of you. I just want to make notice my friend, uh, Conrad Hermogenes, uh, Stand up, comrade. He's a Filipino boy that's been, not a boy, a man that's been with me now for two years. He's, he's from Mabuhay, Mabuhay. I have to do that, otherwise, I go home and can't find my sport jackets. <laughs> but I, I do want to say, I, I think, it, I, think it, I can say that. Yes. I do want to say, you, first of all, you've been a magnificent audience to me, and I think that I owe so much. To this man sitting here, not to embarrass him, but as he showed clips, we go back so far. But I tell you, when I'm in New York and I get an opportunity to be on his show or to be with him and his wife, Joy, and my wife, Barbara, and I love him as a friend, as a gentleman, and as a great performer. And may God give you years. And I was so, my prayers were with you when you went through your, your terrific operation, which is a tough one to do. And you came out with flying colors, and God is in your corner. Oh, thanks, and I'm Don. in your corner, and I love you, dearly. Thank you very much, Don.